actually just said, Daddy's not coming home. He is in heaven. I saw this sight when it was the hell. I saw this sight when it was the end of the world. Oh, this building is like music to me. I love it. This is the story of the making of the 9-11 Memorial, a behind-the-scenes look at how it was accomplished from idea to installation. There's no bigger honor. There's nothing I can ever do that would top this. We're going to bring the world inside here very soon. It feels wonderful to see it come together. The terrorist attacks of September 11, 2001, left a void in downtown New York. The scarred site and the city's spirit were equally broken. For 10 months, recovery workers clawed and dug through the rubble at Ground Zero, searching for remains. Once that difficult work ended, attention turned to rebuilding, especially the sensitive task of constructing a memorial. We tried with our heart to find everyone, and Having done the best we could with that, we're doing our best to build a memorial so that it's something permanent, something beautiful, something respectful, something emotional. To bring that lofty vision to life, it's been a long and arduous journey filled with controversy, creativity, and dedication. Right after 9-11, a city, state, government entity was formed. Their essential role was conducting the uh, design process, the largest international design competition in history. 5,200 entries from 63 different countries. They conducted that process. Here we go. One of the entries was from a 34-year-old New York architect named Michael Arad. Arad became one of eight finalists with his proposal called Reflecting Absence. The design was conceived of as a clearing in the city. The moment that you cross the street and step onto the Memorial Plaza, you'll know you're in a different place. Arad's design was rooted in his own experience on 9-11. I heard an airplane hit the World Trade Center, and I thought it was sort of a freak accident. And I grabbed my camera to take a couple of pictures, and then I saw the second plane strike the South Tower. It was obvious in an instant that, you know, this was not an accident. Two hours before, both of them were standing, and by the time I got home, they were both down. Deeply shaken by what he had witnessed, Arad was haunted by an image that defied nature. Two square holes carved in the Hudson River. Water flowed in, but they never filled up. It was this very clear image that was in my head, and so I, I sketched and eventually built a small model. I ended up taking it up to my rooftop and photographing it, conveying this idea of the absence in the skyline being mirrored in the river and the voids. And that idea then transformed itself when I started to think about a memorial uh, here at the actual site of the attack. Arad's design sits within the exact footprint of the Twin Towers, anchored by two vast pools lined with waterfalls, each about an acre in size. The heart of the design is a series of bronze panels, or parapets, inscribed with the names of the dead. The parapet is the moment that you get to be intimate with the person that was murdered here. And even if it's a stranger, you will see something in the names that will draw you to them. I always thought of the names displays being a sort of an act of communion with the names of the dead that are in front of you. Michael's original design was very stark. The jury felt pretty strongly that um, the notion of life needs to be brought back in. You know, they suggested that I bring a, a landscape architect on board. Michael Arad called us up one day, and uh, I didn't know who he was. He was a young, young architect, and I had never met him. So I asked him if he wanted to, to work with me on this proposal. And so I called him back and said, yeah, that's great. Let's, let's do this thing. It was one of these cold mornings in New York. My car battery died. I was waiting for the tow truck, and I got a call asking if I could come in. They had some paperwork that they needed me to sign. And I thought, you know, this was just pro forma, like, getting me out of the way. And I said, you know, I can't come in today. I have to take the car to the shop. <laughs> and then they told us we'd won. But to transform the memorial from blueprint to building took more than two years. I can't think of anything as difficult as this job with so many different stakeholders, with the emotional uh, connection with everyone having an opinion. 
Construction finally began in 2006, but progress was slow and frustrating for two more years, bogged down by struggles over cost, security, design details. And that led to a period where people were going, what's really going on down there? When so much had to be done, what people couldn't see below grade to get that foundation in place. And now you're seeing the incredible tangible results of that hard work. To not have a place to gather on the 10 year anniversary just wasn't gonna work. But the clock is ticking to make that deadline. All kinds of trades are part of the process. From stonemasons to iron workers to crane operators. By the time they're done, they will install 8,650 tons of steel, pour 50,000 cubic yards of concrete, and put in over 12 million pounds of rebar. This massive undertaking will cost at least $700 million for the memorial and its museum. But who will take charge of one key mission? Those bronze parapets etched with the names of the nearly 3,000 people who died in the attacks of 2001 and 1993. I'll put a rod, I'm gonna let it cool after I put this rod on it. Enter Chris Powers and his partner, Kurt Wolfmeyer. Like Michael Arad, an unlikely choice for this high visibility, prestigious project. KC Fabrications may be just a two-man company, but in late 2009, with the construction clock ticking, they blow away the competition with a simple and elegant idea. There was a mock-up in the Brooklyn Navy Yard so Kurt and I went down, and all the other bidders were there as well. They mentioned while we were there about no folding of the parapet. All these seams have to be uh, welds. And you can imagine there's 200 feet per side times eight times all of the seams. It just made no sense to stick to that plan. Our minds were already going in a direction. How do you do it cheaper? How do you do it faster? It's a classic aha moment. We immediately thought we're going to back bevel each corner which is this little seam right here. And once you back bevel it, it leaves such a small amount of material. When you break form it, it leaves the proper radius right here. Coming down. They've Coming shown down. the bronze could be folded, despite what the bid specifications call for. They could eliminate those thousands of welds and, in the process, shave millions of dollars and months of labor from their bid. And a rod's design for the panel's elegant shape would be preserved. Come in, Bill. Come in, Bill. So we explained all that to them, and they thought, OK, uh, we love every idea you have now. We just have to see if you can actually pull it off. I said, OK, we'll do that. And they said, so here's what we're going to do. You're going to have basically four days to make a two-foot mock-up, and we're going to have the competition do the same as you as well. You know what I mean? I'll just split them. First thing I did was call Joe. You know what I mean? So that one separate from, from this one on this side. Joe Moretti so runs a two-generation family business in New Jersey called Service Metal Fabricating. For this, we needed 100% experts at machining, and uh, they, they always seem to pull off miracles, quite frankly. The only thing I knew at the time you know, was that basically we either had to get this done in a week or we were out. But they got us all the parts and brought everything to our shop. It was probably four days, 24-7, to get this thing put together. And uh, when we, we showed up with it, not only were they surprised, they said no one else had shown up with anything close to this. Right, I want to push. Yeah, yeah. you want to back oh. it up. Yeah, that's why I wasn't so, going. I was they were certainly the sort of the, the dark horse, yeah, awesome. but they showed such intelligence in their approach, and they just thought about a different way of getting from step A to step B uh, than we had uh, previously done. Chris and Kurt, who only began their business in 2007, win the job. You hit it, I'll pour it up. Even though they operate out of a glorified shed 90 miles north of Ground Zero in rural Gardner, New York. We know we're going to get the job done. As long as I know, we just have to make X amount of parts, X amount of parapets, produce a memorial. We'll do whatever it takes to make that happen. By the time contracts are finally signed in October 2010, they have less than a year to meet the deadline for the 10th anniversary. Joe, nothing else magical we need to do. No parts. We're ready to go. It's all magic from here. OK, no magic. Second. We're all magic. <laughs> it's all going to be tricky from here. First, they have to build a prototype, four parapets, almost 40 feet long, 
The final job will run nearly 1,600 feet. It's a scale mock-up of a corner that's on site. We're going to test many things in the fabrication. And then once we figure it out here, it'll be a lot easier on site. And I, we can push it over there. I just, that's good. It all goes back to the schedule. There's just not a lot of time to do this. So we have to make sure everything's perfect here. It looks like it's lined up at, on, in this direction. It looks like Perfection is what they will need. Their first big milestone, unveiling the prototype for the memorial's board and executives, is less than a month away. Bad corner for sure. me. Sure. Yeah, it's almost 316. It's October 30th, just 10 days to go until the 9-11 memorial prototype's maiden voyage, when the bosses will review their work. It's an exact scale model of a corner section of the pool where the North Tower stood. If they get it right, it will go to ground zero. So the stakes are high, and the team is racing against the clock. There's a lot of work that has to be done in a short period of time. We have to install the bulkheads. There's a cooling system still being designed that has to go in here. We have lighting that has to go on here. Uh, there's reflector panels. There's trays that hold the reflector panels. It seems almost impossible, but we'll do it. Just the fact that how you made it, I understand. you know, the points are going to match up. Yeah. Every single component is built in the virtual world before it's built in the real world. Their creative use of technology is what's making it possible to produce the prototype so quickly. The whole job has already been created on the computer at Service Metal using 3D drafting software. We just basically take what he's done and then we go manufacture it to his plan, which already been predetermined that fits together, works. For example, The parapets each weigh over 1,500 pounds, a lot of weight to move around during installation. So Kurt and Chris want their mounting post to have what's known as an XYZ plate, which allows each panel to be adjusted in any direction with just the turn of a screw. Service Metal builds them one. Where they would otherwise have to use shims to sit here and adjust the heights of the parapets and hammers to push them back and forth. Now they're just going to turn screws. Everything's going to move real easy. Yeah, you got to just slide that plate back with an adjustable straight back. That should just drop right in. There it goes. We're in. I like those XYZ plates now, baby. That's right. <laughs> you like when awesome. that slams home. That was awesome. Yeah. The 3D software streamlines the process, but there's still no substitute for a real-world test. A computer will get you 95, 99% there. There's that 2% or 3%, you know, you're just never sure about until you physically make it. Go up a little bit. The most difficult part of this whole mock-up is this corner. There's just so many things that have to marry perfectly. There's so perfectly. many mathematical things that are happening here, to, you yeah. know. To have And they to... always work on CAD. Yeah, I'm going to cut this point off. They're trying to achieve the same precision I'm trying to achieve without automated equipment. So that's where the installation is really an art, you know, more than a science. Yeah. Fat is gorgeous. It's a fantastic project. It's almost like everything we've built up here has been put to use for this job. This is Ron Vega from the Memorial Foundation. Ron's our project manager, okay? Alice Martin lost her firefighter husband, Peter, on 9-11. He died in the South Tower, leaving his wife and three little boys, ages six, eight, and 13. That was actually taken in July of 2001, right after a very busy fire. You can see he's a little dirty. It's become my favorite picture in the world. Alice and her sons were invited to service metal to watch Peter's name be stenciled into the bronze with this giant water jet. So one of you guys, if you'd like to start the machine, okay. you could all do it. <laughs> Ready? Ready? As a fireman's wife, you kind of keep it in the back of your mind, well, something could happen, but at the same time, you say, oh, nothing is ever going to happen. And I remember going down to my kitchen at 4 a.m. and realizing this is real. Wow, unbelievable. Touch it. We'll be the first ones to touch it. You should be yeah. there. You guys <laughs> the worst thing is when you lose a loved one and you worry that they will be forgotten. We got you. We got that covered. They will not be forgotten. 
But when a family comes, it's somber in some ways, but in other ways, it's very invigorating. And it kind of gives us, it not only me, but I think it gives my, my whole crew a boost. Where you see the raised letters, we basically just cut away the material we don't want and leave the letters behind. The memorial panels have two distinct kinds of lettering. The names of the victims, like Peter Martin, are incised, cut all the way through the metal. So you can see that these start to develop. But identifiers, like flight number or fire company, are embossed or raised. So now this is going to take the letters to another level of detail. They go from very large covers to rough it all out, and then slowly, slowly they get to a smaller and smaller tool. This tool looks like it's even too big to do the center of the A, but it'll probably do some of the center of the D. Before the machine ever pierces the metal, a computer program has done it first. Each one of these lines represents a cutter going around that particular part. And the more tool pads you make, the smoother it looks in reality. So what we can do here is we can simulate all the cutter action on the machine before the machine does it. Every day that I work on this job, I have that same feeling. And a lot of those people that died in there were our age, and they were our friends, and they were friends of our friends. So it's, uh, it's a very emotional job. By early November at Ground Zero, the memorial pools are taking shape. Derrickmen hoist 400-plus pound slabs for stone setters to clad the 30-foot deep basin with a black granite called jet mist. Each pool will have a total of nearly 2,500 pieces. A few of them were not quite up to the standard that we have for this project, so they had to be replaced. They still have to do this one, right? They haven't swapped it out yet. OK. It's a privilege to be able to bring this much care and consideration to every small aspect of the memorial. Pressure's all on Christine because, you know, she's the genius patina person, and uh, at the moment, I'm muddling along trying to help her. The finished surface of the bronze, called patina, is a kind of permanent chemical paint, and it's all about craftsmanship. And there are certain recipes that it's very evident that this alloy just loves. It just totally takes it. So, you know, I am looking for that. You know, that to me is a very sound home run, so to speak. It looks great. Yeah, I'm really happy with this. Gorgeous. I was really trying to pay attention to the very small areas. I Jimmy rigged a, a special brush for this. I kind of cut down a brush that just has a few bristles. Yeah, yeah this looks really good. A lot to do this week. It's OK. Yeah. 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 Yep. OK, one more cut, and then we'll know. Finally, it's November 9th. Tired but fueled by adrenaline, the team spends all day fine-tuning and tweaking. Everyone is just check, double-checking everything to make sure it's correct. So we're checking the dams, we're checking the doors, we're checking the lights, and we're checking the reflectors. You ready? Yeah, let's lift it up. On oh, my side. Going up. Catching that, the, the angle in the back. Can we get that up a little bit? Here, I'll help you out. I know exactly what to do. The idea of having a prototype or a mock-up is to have the problems happen. You want them to happen here. You're it. not going to come down anymore. You're good. That did it. Nice. Okay. If we encountered them while we were doing the installation on site, uh, that would set you back months. November 9th, 2010 is a double benchmark for the memorial. The North Pool waterfall is tested for the very first time. It was beautiful. When the sun hits it, it actually looks like bits of diamond. And then you'll see a rainbow dance from one side to the other side. 16 mechanical pumps will recycle all the water in both pools at a rate of 52,000 gallons per minute. Can you believe it? Wow, 24 hours, what a difference. <laughs> you probably never thought in a million no, no, years. I could tell. Looks great. Beautiful, isn't it? Absolutely. Like you want you want to touch exactly, it. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, it's a real. You didn't get it on your finger. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. George Pataki was New York's governor on September 11th, 2001. Good to see you. I am just really moved by by how you're drawn into it. Yeah. You know, it's not something where you just passively stand back yeah. and look at it. 
It was the first time so many people had come and actually seen what we were doing. It, it did feel good. I felt like I was doing the right thing, you know. I was, I was doing the job right. We had a bidders uh, meeting at the markup at the Brooklyn Navy Yard, and they came, and I was like, they seemed like such long shots. And actually, on the way up here, I was like, I'm so glad that it worked out. You were kind of a brought... long shot, too, Michael. Yeah, that was <laughs> a lot of long out. shots. Right? A lot of long shots, but That's it turned right. out yeah. just tremendous. The prototype works. Now they have 148 panels to go, and only 10 months left till the 10th anniversary. Through the fall of 2010, work on the 9-11 memorial is moving at a fast pace. The first pyramid will be on this west wall on the north corner, right where those guys are. And I think we're going to have nine posts here Monday morning. Once we set those, we'll be ready for pyramids. You know, the world's watching you, and, and, and no matter what, you are going to get this job done. I'll go ahead and pick this guy up. And each one being uh, 110 pounds, after about 10 of these, you're ready for a good massage. In what will eventually become a kind of urban forest, workers plant some of the first trees by the South Pool. You gotta go two inches south. Four. Whoa, 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 whoa. That's it. Put a little soil under there. These particular trees are one of the more hardy species you can get in this particular area. A year from now, the plaza's gonna be open. It's gonna look nice. That's the last weld. That's number 24 of 24. That was just the final weld, sealing the surface of the weirs. All around the top of the memorial pools, millwrights finish installing the weirs, finger-like dams that will guide the water as it cascades over the edge. It's all stainless steel. Everything has to be stainless to match so it don't rust. If it's going to be here a couple of hundred years, we want to look pretty for that long. How much more meaningful could it get, really? Uh, <laughs> it's, uh... i do this one for nothing, really. By late November, production of the parapets is in full swing at Service Metal in Dover, New Jersey. When you come to see it, John's name is going to be on the bottom row, right? So, and look, he's right next to it. John Swain and Tommy yeah. Gallman. And Thula Katsimatidis, a memorial board member, is here with her mother. And Thula's brother, John, died in the North Tower. John was never recovered, so we were never given anything. Yeah, it's very hard when you have a tombstone and there's nothing there. There's my Johnny. What, what we're doing here today is we're water jet cutting the names, which are the cut through lettering on the panels. And that's what the water is forced through, that little tiny hole. 40 thousandths of an inch diameter hole, 60,000 PSI of water pressures forced through. So there's a little bit of sand that comes in here and you can control how much comes out how many pounds per minute it's fed down through this tube, and then it mixes with the water. And then the water and the sand cut through the brass. Wow, wow. Very nice, beautiful. Really beautiful. Amazing. I don't go down to ground zero, but um, now, with the, with the completion of the memorial, oh, I'll be down there. So 
Just unpack these guys. Now the team's next deadline looms. The first batch of completed parapets must be installed at ground zero in less than four weeks by early January 2011. So far, everything's going exactly how I hoped. So I hope I didn't just jinx myself. But there's a problem they need to solve. The bronze can get as hot as 200 degrees in the summer heat. Let's just see if we can go past. It was only after the memorial's design was locked they realized the panels would need a cooling system. I've personally touched the panels in the summer, and, and it is too hot. A glycogel run through flexible hose will flow into a series of copper pipes and regulate the temperature year round. But the add-on is awkward. The different trades have been struggling to make it work since early fall. Things are butting into things. You just have to marry so many different pieces together. The problem is with where that pipe fits in here. It's December 22nd. Installation D Day is less than two weeks away. They still haven't mastered that cooling system. I just worry like we're pushing a car and we hit a bolt and the thing just goes. Yeah. I lose a lot of sleep still worrying about making a date. You know, we haven't even had all the problems yet we're going to have. Why crack until you have to, right? I'm too tired to crack at the moment. Ne next week will be a big week, you know? Yeah, next week's going to be crazy. We'll really see something next week if, if it's going to happen or not. With hard work and a bit of luck, they make the January deadline. So the second he gets here, the truck will come in. We're going to pick it up and put it over that stone. We're going to go right over. Don't let that spin too much. Just let it hang there for two seconds. Do you have a knife on you? Yeah. Ready? Whatever you want, brother. OK. It's That's a good. big That's day, good. a major milestone for the job. All the mock-ups, all the studies, everything, to actually see it installed. That's exciting. It's really exciting to see that. Wait. You're in, Chris? Onward from here. I can't wait. Number one's in. We only have 99% more to do. But Mother Nature isn't helping. With frigid temperatures and seven major storms, January 2011 turns out to be the snowiest in New York's history. My hand's frozen. But you have to take your gloves off to really adjust these, and then your hand turns into a little ice block in 20 minutes. Digging that. You gotta give it back. Man, putting that right in my pocket. Jeez. If the weather is brutal, coordination at the site can be too. This day, Chris has been waiting three hours just to get his truckload of parapets inside the gate. You'll see him trying to maneuver into here, and it's going to be a really tricky. I, I already walked the driver over, and he kind of looked at me like, are you crazy? We got to move all this out of here. Ready? Ready? Go. 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 So he can kind of swing like that now. I'm stressing out now because I want to get this done. So I'm just pissing away money. By day's end, they prevail. And in fact, the KC crew gets ahead of schedule, installing two full sides of the North Pool in just one month. You're not coming in tomorrow because of snow. Right. So I'd like to get like, like a week's worth in right now. All right. OK. The pace of work in the mechanical spaces below ground, 70 feet down to bedrock, is as active as above. See, we're concentrating on all the overhead mechanicals, duct work, conduits, piping. It's all the domain of Lou Mendez, who has a long history at Ground Zero. I was here 9-11, 2001. Then I stayed here for a year. I ran all the field operations for the cleanup. So that was, I thought that that was the biggest job that I had ever done. And now this is the biggest job. The pumps for the North Pool are here. These are the pumps. Those are filtration systems. We're underneath the bottom of the pool. If you go up the, the stairs, open up that door, basically you'll be at the lower void of the pool. Back above ground, 
construction hits a snag. In early February, some faulty waterproofing is discovered that must be fixed before any more parapets go in. If that isn't bad enough, is that okay, though? the cooling system needs yet another round of redesigning on the fly. And if it was rotated this way, you're saying it's going to... And it would be off angle too far. What I would do is I would, I would put these pipes on. Once, so once you get this one dimension to straighten out, this vertical... Yeah. It seems to be the only hit. Then that would be consistent throughout. Yeah. There's still things that are completely resolved at this point, and that's, you know, with, with six months to go, that's... Uh, that's a little too tight for me to be working on <laughs> nailing stuff down in its final design at this point. I'm gonna heat that up. Oh, we're gonna push it in after we heat this up. They finally figure it out. But the solution involves retrofitting every single panel, including the ones they've already installed at ground zero. Okay, this one's ready to come down. We started this 11 weeks ago doing the first remediation. Now we're doing it basically again. Every single parapet. 100 of them are done, and they all have to be rebuilt plumbing-wise. Now we have this, and it should work fine. You know, three strikes, you're out, but now the three strike is going to work. Hey, Mike? It better. With all the delays, no new parapets have been installed in three months. They're piling up at KC. These are basically all ready to go. This is the North Pool just sitting, waiting to be installed. There are only 18 weeks until 9-11-11. Failure cannot be an option. the knee wall going soon but i think they actually have to take some of this uh some of these pieces out as the countdown to the 10th anniversary continues architect michael arad and memorial president joe daniels make regular site visits to monitor progress there's a lot that needs to happen before it's done we have enough time you feel like with schedule and all that yeah but we don't have any time to waste it's true the anxiety level is pretty indescribable. I mean, there is no margin for error left in the project. We're going to lift it up, you slide it under. In mid-May, the KC team finally gets the green light to resume installing new panels. Keep coming five on a cable, keep taking it right. Keep it coming on a cable, keep coming on a swing. And hold that right there, hold everything. You OK? There we go. Yep. At last, both the work and the weather have turned a corner. Come on down about two inches, Jerry. OK. Hold that, hold, hold that. Keep coming. A little more. No, you're good right there. We're good. Nice. All the planning's working out. And it's not raining. That's amazing. It's the first time I've set a parapet without a snowstorm or a sleet storm. <laughs> Everyone who works on the memorial knows full well how much it means to the 9-11 families. People will remember that those people were people, not just names, that they were names that belonged to a human being with a life. The Martin family have never been to Ground Zero, but with the 10th anniversary close at hand, they take a tour of its perimeter, gazing over the landscape that claimed Peter. They are comforted by the rebuilding. See all those men with their hard hats and to hear the drills? It shows that we're going to rebuild and life goes on. It wasn't a dark, gloomy place. It was a tower that was being built. It was the complete opposite of destruction. It was construction. The Memorial Plaza will epitomize that affirmation of life. Over 400 swamp white oak trees arrayed throughout the eight acre site will ultimately soar 60 feet in the air. So they grow up and they almost make a gothic sort of colonnade. The park had to change your mood from the cacophony of the street. 
It will be like an inner city forest, but a meticulously designed one. So you have order along one axis, looking east-west, you see these trees snap into these clear rows. But when you look north-south, there is a much more haphazard, naturalistic pattern. This New Jersey field was converted to a nursery in 2006 to nurture the memorial trees. Hundreds of 18-foot trees were hand-picked and moved here and now stand 30 feet. Their care and tending is as painstaking as their design. Each one of those root balls weighed roughly 10,000 pounds. So we took a hunk of soil that weighed 10,000 pounds with a tree growing out of the middle of it and put it in these boxes and rooted it out. So it, it's quite a process. Most urban trees are, have a death sentence. They've been planted in a shoebox. They're only going to grow as big as they can, and then they'll, they'll, just, they'll just stop if they, if they survive at all. So what we've done with this design is given every possible advantage to the tree. So right here is where the irrigation point of connection is supposed to be. Yeah. So I guess we can get in like here. Yeah, there's a short tunnel right here. Networking throughout the memorial are a series of these maintenance tunnels with all of our utilities. Oh, here we go. God forbid you forget something in here. Every drop of rain is caught and taken down through a whole system into a tank. And then that water is used again to irrigate the ground cover and the grass and the trees. Water is one of those beautiful things. You can see the wind just catching us. Oh, yeah. It's really pretty cool. Water architect Dan User masterminded the creation of the Memorial Waterfalls. We have a void here where the tower stood. The concept was that that water would fill that void and it would be this cleansing action, that, that healing process. With over 350,000 gallons of water cycling through each pool, these fountains are truly one of a kind with challenges to match. One of the first things that I saw when I said I saw the length and the size of this thing is, is how is it going to be sustainable? Dan came up with this idea of these fingers, which would let the water through, but not use as much water. The fingers of water hold their visibility and the uniformity all the way down from the top to the bottom. And so you can get away with a lot less water. But the pool's massive size, each the equivalent of a three-story building, made them impossible to test with a smaller model. The problem with water is that it doesn't scale. You know, a little fountain doesn't look like the fountain is going to look. So finally, Dan's built this huge thing, full scale, 30 feet high. I ended up doing it in my backyard. We had it up for four seasons. We wanted to see how it was going to behave in the winter, in the spring, in the summer. And when I saw that model, I knew it worked. It's really humbling to see all the agony that's happened. And to see this renewal is really just wonderful. On the 10th anniversary, when families come here for the very first time, I do hope they understand just by looking at the names and the space around the names that they see that there's each name has been given a real presence. How the names would be arranged on the parapets has been one of the most difficult issues to resolve. The challenges with the names is, what is the function of the memorial? How much information is it supposed to convey? Do we have the floors where people work? Do we have the ages? Do we have the ranks of firefighters? After years of controversy, they finally agreed to group people by where they were the day of the attacks. World Trade Center, Pentagon, one of the planes. But was that enough? Something that was very important to me from the get-go was that there would be sort of a hidden logic to why one name was next to another name. And I suggested what I called the, the uh, meaningful adjacency. So there would be a meaning to why one name is adjacent to another name. We went out to all the families in 2009 and, and gave them the opportunity to request if they wanted their loved one's name next to somebody else. And we had 1,200 requests, and we were able to meet all those adjacencies. It really resonates to see him listed next to Tommy and John and all his friends. It was comforting to see him alongside the other names of the people that he worked with, to see that John was surrounded by the gang that he worked with, you know? Wow. And Thula Katsimatidis has come to KC to be an intimate part of the process herself. To be working on my brother's name, to know that my hand is involved in the memorialization of him is just an awesome feeling.
That's good on your height right there, Jerry. Take it right. Swing, get you away from the trees, you can boom it back to you. Good height right there, Jerry. Back at ground zero, the KC crew is working double shifts to make the 10th anniversary deadline. Let's get this sucker in there. Coming down easy? That's good. This will be all right, as long as everything keeps going like it is now. Thanks. Yeah, excellent. Thank you, sir. Excellent. That's it. Can't complain. Yeah, you gave him a home run today. That's right. I don't want to get cocky yet. Let's get a pool gun first. They're in the home stretch, so long as they can keep up the pace. Go down. Go ahead down a little bit. It's late spring 2011, just a few months left to the 10th anniversary. The 9-11 Memorial Plaza is a whirlwind of activity. It's incredible I mean, to stand here with all these trees behind us and the paving below us and the plaza, and the pool and all the elements coming together. It's great. We're in the final stages. If you're making a meal for, you know, 100 guests, I mean, everything is cooked and everything is set, but you're still kind of running around and uh, fixing the last few things. Welcome, everybody. As you can see, we are making progress. And uh, so far, we are on budget and on time. New York Mayor Michael Bloomberg is the chairman of the memorial. Hi, guys. Good to see you again. Be safe. Yeah, how are you? Yeah, thank you. Where we're looking at now, which is the west side of the South Pool, is the mayor and memorial president Joe Daniels lead the board on a tour. As the mayor said, lots of progress. We're 123 days away, um, and we're all out till we get to the 10th anniversary and beyond. It's hard to to come to terms with 3,000 people lost. I hope that when people will come here, they'll walk around both pools, they'll see the thousands of names that are here, but they will also learn individual stories, not just about the people who died that day, it's also about the people who are left behind. I don't think that anyone can come to the site and only feel sadness. You know, I mean, if that happens, we've failed, you know, and I don't think that we're going to fail. I think that this memorial is really going to inspire people, you know, and bring hope. <laughs> With each passing day, more and more trees dot the landscape, slowly but surely filling in that urban forest. We need to go this way, about two inches, so come up on the suspension and down on the suspension over here. I've been doing this 34 years, maybe the best planting of trees, just in terms of resilience from transplant. They're rich green, they look like they've been here forever. As the Memorial Plaza nears completion, there's less room to maneuver as they plant the trees. So environmental design custom builds a contraption to snake through the site and get the job done. This is the first machine of its type ever built anywhere in the world. And so we're having to finesse the intricacies of the machine while doing production. Let's lower it down, see what we got. That's good. Let's go the other way. Come down a little bit, just a little. Perfect. The end is in sight. There's, there's now about um, 80 trees left to go on the plaza before the, the 10th anniversary. I'm reluctant to declare victory yet, but we're close. Unbelievable. It's breathtaking. Alice Martin comes to Ground Zero in June with Ron Vega to witness the installation of her husband's parapet. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Yes, thank you. Uh, this is exciting. <laughs> I'm speechless, and usually I'm yeah, not, no but it's... to have you here, Oh, my so. goodness. Yeah, we're, we're going to go ahead and install okay. it. And... I'm just going to watch. OK. okay. Just okay. watch your step yep. there. Come on in. OK, hold on a second. We'll go up a little. That's all. That's OK. You make it look easy. Hey, Chris. She said you made it look easy. <laughs> that was just for you. Like, will I be able to thank them? It's an emotional visit for Alice and for the workers. Thank you so much. It means the world to me. Oh, unbelievable. But you're good guys. Thank you. Thank you so much. You're good guys. I could go like that. Does that work? Before the end of June, the KC team surges ahead of schedule and finishes installing all 152 parapets. 
Chris welds those pivotal corner pieces in place, never again to move. Seeing all these panels installed here on site in their final setting, it's phenomenal. On the 10th anniversary, that's the culmination of all that work, all that vision, to see it come to life and to have for the public who has not stepped foot on this space since the day of the attacks. I hope that they'll be able to be here and just feel that we've done something right. For me, a great day is going to be when I can stand back and watch the family members walk up to the parapets and touch them, see them smile, and feel good about it. That's what I want to see. So the circle is complete. From the ashes of 9-11 arose a vision of remembrance and rebirth. And now the vision is a reality, brought to life by that resilient American spirit, which 9-11 perhaps bent, but did not break. Mm -hmm.